Hey dudes, welcome to Splat from the Past, the only 80s themed horror and sci-fi show where things could get totally radical. Now today, I will be welcoming an old friend of mine from the Bay Area who no longer lives in the Bay Area. Her name is Catherine Brinkman. She's an old friend of mine. Um, I knew her brother way long before I knew her, and I'm having her on the show today to uh, talk about movies, maybe catch up a little, uh, because we've been out of the loop of each other for a while, and stuff like that, and I can't wait. Catherine is one of the coolest chicks ever. I can't wait to have her on. So, uh, oh, but by the way, uh, today is the 39th anniversary since um, John Lennon was shot. Rest in peace, John Lennon. Rest in hell, Mark David Chapman. So, yeah, here is my interview with Catherine Brinkman. Hey, Catherine. Hey, Tommy. How are you? I am great. Sorry about that. I had a malfunction. (laughs) No, no worries. No worries. It's been a while. How's it been? Oh, my God. It has been a clusterfuck. It's been amazing, too, at the same time. So, are you doing stand-up like this is your job? I, I haven't been doing much stand-up since I moved up here to Redding, California, but I started um, this podcast in my bedroom two years ago. Cool. Cool, cool. Yeah. Oh, my God. The last time we talked, I was, like, on the verge of living on the streets, pretty much, and it was just a, a horrible year. 2014 was just the most horrible year. My mom and I were just living out of the car, you know, staying at people's houses and stuff and just looking for jobs. I eventually did get a job as a security guard. And then I got hit by a, I got hit by a car in January of 2015 and I spent 30 days in a coma. No way. Yeah. Wow. It's pretty fucking bad. Dude, so did you have any permanent damage? Yeah, broke my leg in, tw- in seven places. And crushed my ribs, uh, broke my hand, broke some teeth, got some pretty bad injuries. I had like 12 surgeries out of it. That's bad. Yeah. <laughs> I don't mean to begin this on such a down note, but <laughs> that's, what, that's what happened. And it's been really, really difficult, but it's been really great, too, because I'm here and I've got 635 episodes of this podcast and more on the way. Cool. Yeah. Good deal. Yeah. So, my God, so so when did you move to New York? Um, I moved in the, like, I moved permanently in May of 2017. Wow, that's just one month after I moved up here. I moved up here in April of 2017. Yeah. Yeah. I was splitting time since like August 2016, mm-hmm. um, and then I just suddenly was ready to let go of the business stuff that I was doing in California and make the move and just focus on New York. Really? Do you like New York at all? I love New York. <laughs> <laughs> I love New York. I would. It would be a very, very cool day if I ever moved back to the Bay Area. I was down in the Bay Area last week, and oh my God, it's not the same anymore. The whole El Camino in San Carlos is unaffordable housing. I've heard that, like, it's changed so much even in the last two years. Yeah, pretty much. It is just, it's just awful. And I saw it all happening. I saw all these projects happening after I got out of the hospital. And just, I was just like, I got to get out of here. And yeah. My mom, you know, she couldn't, she, she didn't even have good credit to get a, a new place for us to live and stuff. So we came up here because my godparents were up here and we got an apartment because they didn't do any, um, any security checking or any credit checking here. So that's why we're here. Now we're working on getting me to L.A. next year. Oh, cool. I like that. I like yeah. great. I love L.A. Yeah. yeah, that is that would be one place I would move back to California for. But not the Bay Area. 
Yeah, I'll get back into stand up over there. I just I've been taking a break from it. I had a lot of shit happened in the Bay Area comedy scene. I had a lot of haters. I had a false Me Too scandal. It was just a mess. Wow. Yeah. But oh my god, yeah, so I'm trying to think here. So yeah, I mean I wanted you to come on the podcast so we can catch up and, you know, talk about movies. You know? Cool. Yeah, because I've been going to conventions the last couple of years and meeting all my idols and interviewing them and stuff, and movies are the only thing that makes me happy in life. That's their job, right? (laughs) Yep. (laughs) So do you remember the first movie you ever saw? The first movie I remember seeing was E.T. Wow. E.T. Yeah. Yeah. I was obsessed with that movie. I'm still like, it's, I mean, it's a classic, right? But that's the first movie I remember seeing in the theater. I think I was like four. Mm-hmm. Um, that's that's the first one. The, the other ones I remember were like the romancing the stone movies with Kathleen Turner and Michael Douglas. Oh God. <laughs> um, so that's the kind of film I remember as a kid. Yeah. Oh my God, I saw. Let's see, the first movie I can remember seeing, Cannonball Run, Burt Reynolds' race car movie. Oh, yeah, that's a classic. Yep. For sure. Saw that one. The first horror movie I remember seeing was The Shining, and I didn't want to see it for a long time after that. Now I love it. It's one of my favorites of all time. The first one I remember was also Stephen King, and it was Carrie. Mm Mm-hmm. I remember seeing that and being like, I was young. I didn't even know how little I was, but I just remember looking at my dad being like, this is gross. And I walked out, but I didn't finish it. It was on HBO, I think, on like TV when I was a kid. It was definitely something I was supposed to be watching. Um, but it later became one. I mean, it's another classic. Carrie, Stephen King does a good job. Yeah. Obviously. <laughs> yeah. I'm friends with an actress who was in Carrie. Uh, she was one of the bitches. Uh, she doesn't have a line, but uh, she's in there. Her name's Terry Bolo, and she's also uh, in Pee Wee's Big Adventure and so many movies where she's like a background person. Yep, that's good. Yeah, I know. I looked at who one of podcasts. You have a lot of people on here. It's cool. Yeah, I'm so fucking lucky. I just, you know, I just send them emails. I'm just genuine and sincere, and they respond. But don't get me wrong, I've had a lot of people who who ended up being jerks that did not want to do the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine. Oh, yeah. Uh, but, yeah, so what are your favorite movies of all time? I'm going to go with A League of Their Own is one of my favorites. Oh, love Sam that. is one of my favorites. Um, Anything baseball. Another yeah, baseball. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, another one that's kind of like, weird, I guess, would be Chicago. I love that movie. That's a good um, one. Just that scene with Mae Zellinger and Richard Gere, where she's a puppet. It, it's like one of the best scenes ever. Like I almost applied to film school. Well, I didn't almost apply to film school. I was filling out the application for UCLA Film School. Mm-hmm. And they couldn't. They're like, what's your favorite movie? And I couldn't think of one. And then, like, a year later or six months after, it was very short after that application was due, I saw Chicago and was like, shit, that's my favorite movie, just on the choreography, the direction, the cinematography, the costumes, everything that came together in that one scene. I was like, that is a film. Um, so that was, like, a pivotal one. Um, my other, one of my other favorites is Beverly Hills. That's a classic. Oh, God. Movie. I love that movie. Oh, God, it's so wrong. I love it. <laughs> um, and then, I mean, going more current, uh, I mean, I just saw The Laundromat on Netflix, mm-hmm. which was really, really good. Um, I watched the report on Amazon last weekend. That was also very, very good. It's a political themed film or another, like, genre. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's, I think, what are my other favorite movies? So 
so many, but definitely like the top three would be the Sandlot, Chicago, um, and then over the ground. Yeah. Oh my God. So I have a great top 10 list. Oh my God. I love my favorite movie of all time is back to the future. Yeah. I love that movie. I love, uh, night of the comet. You ever seen that? No. Oh God. I, I need to, I, I'm, I'm telling so many people about that movie who have never heard of it. They, Oh my God. Everyone's got to see it. It's about these two teenage Valley girls in LA who wake up and they're the last two girls on earth. And then they find out that there's more people on earth who survived. And there's these scientists that were, uh, that were doing the, the, this experiment, turning everyone into comet zombies. And it is so damn funny. It's, it's not, it's not a horror movie at all, but it's, it's, it's so damn funny. It's a quirky offbeat sci-fi comedy. Definitely. It's from 1984. It's hilarious. And um, let's see what else. I love all the Kevin Smith movies like Clerks and Mallrats. Yes. I love the original Rocky, uh, Amadeus, Bonnie and Clyde, One Flew of the Cuckoo's Nest. Yeah, the, the original Superman, 1978. Yeah. Some great movies there. And then let's see. Yeah. And then, I, and then you know, I'm a big horror freak. I love the original Friday the Thirteenth, the original Dawn of the Dead, Nightmare on Elm Street Three, uh, Chopping Mall. Uh, this great little horror movie from the early '80s that Charlie Band made called The Alchemist that he never talks about and other people never talk about it. But I think it's a great movie and people should see it uh, regardless of how bad it is. And sometimes those are the best movies, though. Oh, yeah. Like, those end up being things that just like stick in pop culture. Yeah, so bad it's good. <laughs> mm-hmm. That's what they call it. And then, um, love the, I love, um, the 1931 Dracula is a horror favorite of mine. That was a good one. And the original Frankenstein. Yes. It was very good. I just interviewed Boris Karloff's daughter. That's cool. Yeah, she was really That's cool. That's very cool. Yeah. She has some really good anecdotes about her father. Um, but the other one that was really good that's more recent is um, Get Out was really good. Oh, I loved Get Out. I saw it in the theater, and I was just like, man, this is really bold, and I just love it. And that maid is so damn creepy, and she's so good. I hope she gets more roles. Yeah, it, that was a really good movie. It was just not expected either from who you know from who wrote it from a comic standpoint. Um, and it was just so jacked, like how the acting was so good. It was great. Mhm. Yeah. I, just, I, I don't know. Jordan Peele has kind of turned me off ever since he's made those statements about, you know, how he'll never make a movie where there's a white person in the lead and stuff. I don't know, there's something about that that, that just turned me off and stuff. But I hope I hope he continues being successful. But I don't know, I'm just turned off by that comment. <laughs> but um, let me see. God, there's so many. I just saw It Chapter 2. I have not seen any of it it's yet, actually. Um, a very good friend's daughter is obsessed, and she is on me to watch it, and I still have not. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, like, I've quoted it into this whole thing. It's really cool. Um, but, yeah, no, I haven't seen it. I saw the, the old school one, for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, and I read the book. Yeah. Um, I saw the, I saw both, I saw the, the first it and then chapter it in the, uh, chapter two it in the theater they're both great second one i liked even more i mean a lot of people didn't like the second one when it came out a few months ago because they said it was over long and it was there's there wasn't enough scares i thought there was plenty of scares in it but there was plenty of comedy though uh, bill Hader is in it and his character is a stand-up comedian and there's a there's a part at the beginning of the movie where he bombs on stage and it was really funny and then he's just being a wisecracking smart aleck for the rest of the movie. And 
he really he really makes the movie, I think. I need to watch it. Definitely. Yeah. I saw the Mr. Rogers movie. Is that good? It was very good. It, it it's not really about Mr. Rogers, really. It's about how how he incidentally changed the life of this journalist that interviewed him. The journalist had a bad relationship with his father, and Mr. Rogers helped him with it. And it's more about that than anything. And Tom Hanks is just brilliant in the role. I mean, he really becomes Mr. Rogers. Awesome. There's a lot of movies I need to see. There's just so many anymore. With like, I mean, it's just constant with the, the big studios, and then you have everybody else now putting out films. So um, there's a lot to to do, but going back to, like, the genre of, of horror, um, do you, I really like the Scream series, and I know it's, oh, yeah. it's almost like a parody of a horror film. Right. It's pretty good. I'm wondering, do you consider that a horror film? I consider them horror comedies, uh, more than anything. Okay. And there was movies before that, that, um, that, that was just like Scream, but, uh, nobody saw them, but I've seen them, obviously. Um, there's a movie with uh, Caroline Monroe called The Last Horror Film, which was kind of a self-referential uh, horror parody. Um, there was a movie called Return to Horror High, which was a lot like Scream. I'm surprised no one has ever picked up on it on the internet. It's a lot like Scream. And there was a movie called Waxwork, which was kind of self-referential, but that was... Uh, really brutal as a horror movie. Lots of uh, slashings in it and stuff. But yeah, I do consider Scream part of the horror genre. Yeah, just the setup of Drew Barrymore and that opening scene, and then she's dead like within five minutes. And so, had Blue back in the day and made a lot of headlines. And it was just, it was cool to see so many people go to see a movie because based on who had top billing and then they die within yeah. five minutes and then you have like Nev Campbell who nobody really knew at that point right um kind of did from Party 5 and I don't even I think Wild Things had already come out but then she got famous off of it um so it was just that's a really good series in my opinion I enjoy those movies still I that is Zombieland Oh. I really like that movie. I love that one. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I need to see the new one, but I love that one. And also, I love I love I love the the first two scary movies that make fun of Scream. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, oh. they were good, and that those were another like kind of first in the industry to do that type of movie. Yeah. Do you it was know, great. It was almost like sketches within. A main concept, so it was cool. I was a senior in high school when I saw the first scary movie, and I fell in love with it when the guy ejaculated, and there was like a whole oil well of semen. <laughs> that's how I of fell. Of course you did. Of course you did. That's how I fell in love with that movie, <laughs> and I was so glad they did again in the second one. I can't remember the, the other sequels. They were terrible. I don't really pay attention to the ones after two. But that was uh, what I liked about that. I feel like it is going to go on, though. It's going to be this new thing. Do you, do you know what I think? I think um, because they, they remade the original TV miniseries, you know, yeah. better, I think. I think... I think because it's successful, it is going to continue, but probably against Stephen King's wishes, they're probably, or maybe they will consult him, who knows, they'll probably maybe do some kind of prequel, like maybe a, new, a different generation of kids, like oh, before them, be kinda cool. or maybe even, you know, a generation of kids now or something, you know, I, I, but I think you're right, I think it will continue because it's making money. Money and like I said, Nina is 16 and she is all into it, and that's like their first. That's like their their horror thing. You know what I mean? Like, and it's I, 
zombies are okay and cool, but there's been so many zombies from like 2005 to, you know, before it. It's kind of like, I think people are over zombies, and this is a new scary thing. <laughs> and then it sucks, but in conjunction with like people dressing as clowns and freaking people out in their neighborhood. So it's like a blend of social media with the movie, with real life. Mm-hmm. I think it's going to go on for a while with. I don't even know what generation they are, but the, the teenagers, that's going to be their thing. That's what they're going to remember. Absolutely. Do you remember a movie that came out around 2002 called Fear.com? Yes. That movie was not popular, Wait. and I thought it would be, because, you know, they're talking about, what this is before social media, and, you know, I mean... We had, like, chat rooms in AOL and what have you. I thought it would be more popular because they were talking about the dangers of what could happen and stuff, you know. But I, I think in the next few years, they're going to come out with a movie just like it, but about social media. So, I mean, what's also your take on, because you're clearly in the movies, and you go to the super big, I'm not even big budget, I wouldn't say, because I wish I just came out and that thing was colossal you're going you still go to theater you don't stream i do are you streaming i do stream if the movie is only available in streaming i watch it but i prefer going to the theater or just watching it on you know uh, my dvd or occasionally cable we're actually going to be getting rid of our cable because it's gotten too expensive and my mom doesn't work for comcast anymore but i do enjoy uh, going to the theater still. Yeah, I had movie pass um, for a while, and that thing was great, and that's when I would go and, like, see movies. At least I would go once a day, if you could. Um, yeah. And there's such a different experience between being in the theater and being at home. Um, it's just different. But I saw Irishman, and that was obviously not a horror film, but when you brought up my segue to Irishman is um, when you brought up it doing mm-hmm. like a prequel, the makeup and what they did with like Sumo and Pacino and the Irishman, like that would be so cool to see in a horror movie. Mm-hmm. Do, do yeah. A prequel, so things like Jamie Lee, but a prequel and Jamie Lee are just back as like a teenager, teenager. That yeah. would be kind of cool. Yeah, I did a bit in my uh, stand up act about uh, Jimmy Lee Curtis um, in the movie Trading Places, and it got huge laughs. Another good movie. All these movies were going back from the 80s. Another good movie. Mm-hmm. Trading Places. Yeah. I try, I try, you know, it's funny. I'm doing like a month-long Christmas block on the podcast, getting Christmas movie guests. I did that last year. I'm doing it again this year. I tried to get the girl who played Dan Aykroyd's uh, fiance in the movie. She owns like a clothing line or something now. She has not gotten back to me, but I would love to have her on because she was so good in it. And that was her only movie. She was a model. But, That's cool. But yeah, Trading Places is a great movie. I actually just got a VHS copy of it when I was down in the Bay Area. Uh, you know, Captain Video is still there on the El Camino. Um, in Hillsdale, and when I was coming down a couple times last year, they had 10 VHSs for a dollar, and they don't have it anymore. Now, each each VHS is like a dollar, so I bought five of them, and Trading Places was one of them, and I also had Annie Hall, which is my favorite Woody Allen movie. Another it, classic. Oh, you know what I, you just have to start this conversation, as I just saw when Harry met Sally. So just the, watched it, what was that, two weeks ago? Not even, that's how the whole podcast situation came up. Um, that was a really good movie. I can't believe I didn't see it before. Now, wow, you've never seen it before. I've been watching it since it hit cable in 1990. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I never, I watched, you know, you, I'd watched scenes, but they were the scenes that, like, were shown on the work shows and stuff like that. But just, that was a really well-written, funny movie. Yeah. Um, and just, just because you said VHS, I think my dad even owned the movie, and I don't ever remember watching it. Um, but that's funny. You get VHS. I guess it's not funny. It's nostalgic that you get VHS. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, I, there's a there's a, a comedian I came up with in the Bay Area who's starting to become uh, successful. Her name is Ali Wong, and she made her own version of When Harry Met Sally. It's on Netflix. It's called Always Be My Maybe, and it's really it's 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 pretty funny. Um, I didn't think I was gonna like it because her and I did not get along, and I never really thought she was that funny. But it actually surprised me. And Keanu Reeves has a hilarious cameo in it. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, I know who she is, for sure. She went to UCLA. We didn't, I didn't know her at UCLA. I think I had a class with her. But we're the same. Um, but, yeah, I think she's funny. I didn't know she was in the Bay Area. I had no idea. Yeah, she was there. Um, let's see. She started the year before I did. She started in 05. I started in 06. And when I started, she had been doing it a year. She was already pretty polished. I think she had a long way to go, but she was pretty polished um, at the time. And she knew it, and that was the unfortunate part. So many comedians did not like her. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of them did, but a lot of them didn't. But, you know, based on what I heard, now she's a little more humble and stuff. But when I ever I hear her do an interview, I don't, I don't see it. But that's just me. You know. Yeah, yeah. And that is, uh, so I was with Dale Carnegie for a very long time, obviously. Yep. Um, and then that is part of why I left Carnegie was I wanted to pursue comedy. So how I ended up actually moving to New York is when I quit Carnegie with my 2016 tax refund, <laughs> I decided to take improv, um, whoever is one, or one at UCD yeah. in New York. So I came back and then I was like in a movie class and I spent like a week and a half in New York and had an air speed at a loft in Chelsea and thought, oh, this is New York, this is great. Yeah. I'm going to move. Um, so that's actually how I ended up moving to New York is I took about two years and I really did study comedy. Um, so I took a bunch of satire, actually not a bunch, it should be more specific. Second, the second city has a satire writing program, mm-hmm. three levels, and I actually am part of the first graduating class for that. And then I took sketch writing here at UCD in New York and also through Second City online. Mm-hmm. Then I also have done some more improv through UCD. So it's like, that's part of why I came, came back, um, Good or bad, I think it's annoying. All my comedy stuff tends to be more business focused, and it's not, I don't think I was funny, but it's gotten me some writing gigs for sure. Oh, that's, that's good. They want, you know, companies want humor in their writing, and they want something that's real. Yeah. So, um, it was actually a Carnegie student, my sales class, that sort of like was the instigator. She just, it's like, you're really funny. And I'm like, I don't think I'm supposed to be funny. She was like, you work with would be so boring. I'm like, well, good. <laughs> I think it's funny about it. You're entertained by it. Yeah. I, I, I couldn't do, um, like, corporate gig stuff because I'm not politically correct, you know. And I, I had thought about um, getting into uh, sketch and improv uh, type of stuff when I get out to L.A. Um, because... I've always been very fascinated by it, but when I was taking Mr. Friedman's drama class at San Mateo High, um, I was way too young, and I was just, I didn't have appreciation for it, and I thought it was the hardest thing I have ever done in my entire life. And so, now that I'm older, I want to give it another chance. Yeah, well, and that's the truth be told, is I wanted to do Grand Canal when I was at UCLA, and mm-hmm. um, I got in a little bit of academic trouble. And my parents were like, no way in hell are we supporting you in this. But I didn't do it. I focused on my school. Um, and then I, I think I like to call it my, uh, like, a third life crisis. Because I was, like, in my mid-30s. And I was like, dude, I hate this corporate stuff. I've always wanted to do comedy. I can afford it. I'm going to go do it. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um. And so my original plan was to actually fly back and forth between the Bay Area and L.A. to continue to work at Carnegie, and then it just didn't, wasn't allowed, I guess I could say politically correctly. Um, mm-hmm. wasn't allowed, so I was like, okay, I think I need to quit. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
Oh my god. I Oh my god. Okay, my friend I was telling you about uh, Terry Bolo who's in Carrie, she's a founding member of the Groundlings. Her Shut up. Yeah, her That's hilarious. Her Lorraine Newman, her sister Tracy Newman, um they were taking uh, Gary Austin's uh workshop in LA 1972 and they started you know putting on little shows in his class and then it led to them forming the Groundlings and they were at humble beginnings I'll tell you they they did not have a theater until 1979 they were performing just about anywhere they could doing these shows yeah. they were performing at the comedy store um when um Mitzi Shore would have um Sketch and improv performers go up on stage, call them the comedy store players and stuff. They were performing there. You know, I think they would like rent like the party room of a bakery or something, perform there. I mean, they were, and they had like no chairs. Everyone was sitting on the ground with pillows. I mean, it was humble beginnings, but look at how amazing, you know, it ended up being and all the great people who have been on Saturday Night Live since then. Okay, you mentioned that, so now I got shit today because I was like, SNL's good finally. Yeah. And everyone was like, what are you talking about? Kate McKinnon is, is like your idol. And I'm like, yeah, but the last couple of years, like, it's just been it. And I think it's because they have like, some infusion of LA people from Growlings. I think there's some of them on there. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's three from, three in addition to 80 on the Second City. For a while, it was so UC heavy. And that's such a New York perspective. Yeah. Um, and, like, I, I work very closely with someone that's born and raised in New York, and he wasn't, he didn't know if I was from, he didn't know I was from California originally. And he thought I was a New Yorker. A lot of people back here don't realize that I'm from the West Coast, but it looks that so funny. They don't know. So when Jonathan found out, he, like, totally is in love with the Californians. It's his favorite sketch on SNL. And... It's just, it, he, I was like, why? Like, it's so, SNL's so New York focused. What is it? Because that's not New York focused. That's why I like it so much. <laughs> wow. Yeah. <clears throat> and then, you know, it's funny. I wanted to um, uh, take uh, classes at the Groundlings, too, when I was, like, 17 and stuff. But I had to stay behind and take care of my grandmother until she passed. And then I fell into a depression, you know. And then after I snapped out of it, I had to lose weight. I started doing stand-up comedy. Then I got into the bar life, which was, you know, I look back now and it, it actually prepared me for the present of knowing about show business and all the bullshit that could happen between the entertainment and the owners of the uh, venues and shit. You know, I look yeah. at positive from that perspective, but I just wish I hadn't wasted so much time drinking and hanging out with unsavory people, you know. But you'll have good stories. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, you'll definitely have the stories that you can flip into comedy. I have at least a book in me, you know, especially about all the sex uh, sex capades I had. <laughs> you know. Corporate, that's, that's why you can't get corporate right there. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> And I just, I just don't see, you know, why anyone would want to perform in front, in front of corporate snobs and perform on like, you know, rich, rich snobs on a crew, on a cruise ship, you know. <laughs> it's called a paycheck. It's called a paycheck. Like that's, it. that's the it's only reason. Paycheck. Yeah, that's the only reason why anybody would do that is because of the money, you know. But like, you have to have artistic integrity, you know. Especially if you're dirty, you have to have artistic integrity. And contrary to popular belief, it's actually just as hard, if not harder, to write a dirty joke as it is to write a clean joke. Because... These dirty jokes are more... Um, just what I saw, like, what I saw on Saturday Night Live, like,
there was a couple of things. Like one of my, I'll email it to you actually. Mm-hmm. Um, one of my best things that I got like praised from when I was in, in Satire Three at Second City literally was like it's called I mean it's called Batch Cab and it's all about doing like a protocol search for California prison guards on how to do the vaginal cavity search. <laughs> People loved it. I'm like, this is the most outrageous thing I've ever written. It's pretty disgusting. Um, <laughs> I love and it. And it was like, everyone loved it the most of anything I wrote. How, how, how did you come up with it? I was watching Orange is the New Black. <laughs> um, I was watching Orange is the New Black. I had some other stuff going on in my life where I was like, oh, I don't know about these police right now. I don't know about this system. Um, and I was like, you know what? I'm gonna. How can I make fun of this and not name anybody's name? And I was like, I'm gonna do the whole thing just on prison guards. Here you go. So that was the, the impetus on where that joke um, came from. Wow, I like that. I, I t- I'll tell you something. I've, I've talked to uh, a couple of female comedians, a couple of female writers. You know, and they had to tell me about, um, you know, being in the writing room with, with mostly males and how the, there was like a boys club, you know, and that they um, d- d- didn't have their voice heard because they were women, you know, and stuff. I'll tell you something. I appreciate humor that comes from a, a woman immensely, you know, and like I, I, it's my it's my dream someday to have a wife who who actually comes up with jokes if uh, just as dirty as mine, you know, to like help me write material and stuff, you know, because I think women are hilarious, and I just get really upset when I hear about the boys' clubs going on, you know, in writers' rooms because I think women are hilarious. And I was really fortunate that I had. Um Caitlin Funkel, who was my instructor at Second City, I guess, I don't know what you would call her, teacher. Um, mm-hmm. But she, I am not that smart. And I was like, I'm going to take writing for the union and it'll be fine. And that was the first writing class I signed up for, was writing for the onion. Mm-hmm. And it was a clusterfuck. It was horrible. Um, I don't even remember the guy's name, that someone said blocked it mentally. But the instructor just like fucking with me. And I remember you had to come up with 10 lines and it would take me like one day, it was seven hours to go for 10 lines. I'm like, dude, comedy is not just made as fucking hard. Like what is wrong with this? I'm funny. Everyone says I'm funny. Why am I taking, why is this taking so long? And it just like, it was so hard that I didn't understand until working with Caitlin, who was a female. Who, like, took the time to explain, like, dude, you started out at the wrong level. Like, you never written, you went straight for the onion. Mm-hmm. It's not. <laughs> and I was like, oh. And I almost quit. And she's the one that said, you know, just take Satire 1, see what comes of it. And um, we were bringing up high school. It was actually when I wanted to move back to New York, some of my friends in New York were like, dude, you can't just, like, pick up and move from. San Francisco to New York, like, what are you thinking? And some, how randomly Melissa Fulton put on her Facebook that she was subletting her apartment or, like, she just accidentally wanted it, and she's in New York, I'm like, I'll take it. Yeah. So I actually stayed in her apartment for, like, most of January 2017. I came back again in March to stay there. Um, Mm. God bless her, I, like... I knew I was moving, so in March I left my stuff at her apartment, and the apartments are not big. Um, so I, like, go out into her closet for two months while I was prepping to move back fully. Mm-hmm. Um, but during that time, I remember spending three weeks literally in the winter in New York. I took four different second city classes at the same time. Mm-hmm. It was dedicated a full month to writing. And by the time I did this, like, check-in at the at JFK to walking through security in my mind, I already come up with 10 different one-liners just from looking around me. And now people, like, you know, friends call it comedy college, so they have friends from the Bay Area here in New York. 
that he, you know, the asshole joke is like, oh, well, hey, here, call me, she said he's funny. And you're like, bitch. Gosh, I hate that. <laughs> knock, knock, who's there? What am I going to say? I, I hate that, you know, because they, because, you know, if, because, because they, they've never heard of you, they, you know, they want to see if you're, you know, a liar or not, I think, when they ask you, when they say, you know, tell me a joke, say something funny, you know? Yeah, so I, I got, like, he's a friend, right? Like, yeah. so they don't really know that well, say that I just kind of, like, I just look at them now, and like, you clearly have never even attempted to write. I was doing this. And they just stopped. I get really, it's, like, offensive, because now... Basically, my comedy thing was so humbling because I'm so good at sales or come so naturally and it's so easy that when I came and started doing comedy, I was like, why is this so hard for me? You know, everybody makes it look so easy. And then I remember they, people like you and Alan Wong and Kenan, you've been doing it since you were teenagers. You know what I mean? Like, you've been crafting things subliminally since you were young. I've been selling. I sold ads. I told Ashley that I you know, high school music for. Like, I've been selling since I was 16 years old in Cole Collins since I was 16. Mm-hmm. So, it was humbling to go through that, oh my God, this is actually really, really hard. And they're funny because they've practiced so much and they've done it for so long. That's why it's easy. They put in that thousand, you know, that 10,000 hours. And so, when I do get those comments, I'm like, something funny. I just feel like, dude, fuck you. I'm not going to say anything funny. Um, <laughs> I don't really say fuck you, but I'm just, I give you my look of, like, dude, seriously. Yeah. Then with friends, um, I had so many in, in town a couple of weeks ago, and they made that comment, and I was like, do you want it dirty or clean? <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, what? And I'm like, how much time do I have to get to the one-liners, and you want that dirty or clean? And they were just like, holy shit, I had no idea that you could just walk around and that's how you saw things. Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I used to do that too. I used to say dirty or clean. Now I just say dirty if, if they're offended too bad. You know, I the way I see it, if you're offended by what I say, we're not meant to be friends, you know? <laughs> yeah. But you, you made a very interesting point, though, that I wanted to uh, bring up. Um, uh, what Towards the end that I was in the Bay Area, you know, I, I told everyone my plans of what I wanted to do and stuff, and I heard a lot of good luck, which was probably followed by internal dialogue of, because you're going to need it, and a lot of jealousy telling me, oh, don't go to L.A., there's evil people there and stuff. Don't go in the show business, there's evil people, lots of stuff. I, I have realized, if you tell people what your plans are and what you want to do, and you put it, you put it out there that you want to be successful and or famous – they're going to do everything they can to be negative about it. And they're, it's because they're jealous because they don't have the, the audacity or the tenacity to do what you're doing. Very true. You yeah. have to be creative. Um, I think you have to be creative in anything to be successful. Mm-hmm. But it really is like with comedy. I remember I took, it was like two years ago, I think. I took my sketch class at UC Booty and I was I put it up in front of there was an open sketch night, so I put it up and there was silence. It was horrible. And finally someone in the back said this fucking sucks. Yeah. And in my mind I was like, Yes, somebody said something. And I told my instructor, she goes, And you were okay with that? I'm like, Yeah, because the gone reaction sucks. It was bad. Better than nobody telling me and just not getting it. They just fucking hated it so I could go rewrite it and make it better. Yeah. So then I rewrote it and put it up the next week, and it was a little bit better. And then I rewrote it again, and then I just thought, no, we're not doing this. It's not good. <laughs> but it, it takes that, one, you have to have the guts to put it up, right? Second, mm-hmm. it takes that tenacity to be like, okay, they hated it, let me go and try it again. And then it takes some self-confidence and awareness where you're kind of like, okay, this is the third time. I don't think it's that funny now. I'm gonna throw it away. Yeah. Next. Throw it away for for now, but to keep it just in case you know you get your own Netflix special. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's that bad. I'll oh, it's that bad. It take a lot of work. <laughs> okay. It wouldn't even be a semblance of this. <laughs> I mean, I have rewritten it, and it doesn't even look like the same first thing I wrote at all. Wow. 
yeah, I used to walk around with a notebook um, the first couple of years I did stand up. And then after a while, I just started using my phone you know, like and, you know, I was always constantly focused on jokes because that's what I needed the first couple of years. But now if I just get a funny thought, I write it down. You know, I don't really um, spend, you know, 10 minutes to a half an hour writing jokes anymore. It just there's other things I'm doing, like this podcast. And it's just it, it takes up so much work. And I got 13 years worth of jokes like in an archive, which, by the way, I, I deleted and lost most of my jokes Um after I got out of the hospital and I had to start over again and I actually came up with jokes that were better than a lot of the old jokes I had, but then the old jokes slowly started coming back to me and I remembered them and I have them all written down again. Yeah, it's funny. I have, I have some catchphrases from my political days and I kind of like didn't remember them and I'm starting to get more involved in politics again. Um, and they've come back, and I've been telling some of my comedy friends that didn't know me back then, they're like, that's really funny. I'm like, yeah, you know, like, what the fuck is that one? Absolutely. Hollywood is the, uh, like, politics is the Hollywood for us people. Mm-hmm. It's classic law. We came up with that, like, 2003. Yeah. <laughs> politics is the Hollywood for other people. <sighs> yes, America it. runs on credit. I know that that joke George Carlin had is true. You ever notice the people who are against abortion are people you wouldn't want to fuck in the first place? <laughs> it's true. They're ugly uh, politicians. <laughs> you know how I'm not, like we're going to say now for a film that's coming out that we're going to like comedy? Yeah. You know, it reminded me, I watched Tiffany House's Gossip Club, and mm-hmm. she was just, like, I, she's my favorite comic. Who? Oh, Tiffany Haddish. Oh, Tiffany Haddish. Oh, yeah, she's funny. Um, but she, like, there was aspects of her, of Buffalo Star, where I was like, dude, George Collins, like, better than you. Like, she just went for it and did it. And I've never seen, maybe I don't know, but I've never seen any woman do what she has done mm-hmm. in that way. Amy Schumer, I liked her, um, the first uh, special she did for Comedy Central, the first hour special she did. And then after that, she got too famous, and she's relied on writers. And, you know, writers, you know, steal from other comedians and stuff, and she's been caught in this scandal and all that stuff. It's, 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 it's a shame, but she was hilarious on that first special. I still remember stuff she said that, oh, my God, I can't believe she got away with <laughs> special and that Netflix special, the first one. The uh, first special. Netflix was freaking awesome. And Inside Amy Schumer was hilarious. Fantastic. I didn't, li- I didn't oh. like I didn't like the first Netflix special or the HBO special and stuff. This new one, I mean more of the same, but but, you know, I hope hopefully she'll get she'll get really good again. As as her fame dies down, you know what I mean? You know, but she definitely has a story of um, having a lot going to nothing and then rebuilding. And there's humor in that. But I, I agree with you. But I also, I didn't know this until recently that her and Bruce Kreischer um, were on some on a show together, America's Last Comic Standing, whatever. I'm sure everyone knows it by working and not watching TV. Yeah. Um, but, like, he has made comments about Schumer once in a while. I'm like, whoa, where'd that come from? And then I saw 
these old clips from like 10 years ago of how she treated him. And I'm like, oh, that's where the gratitude comes from. Like, she's not that nice sometimes. Yeah. His... Bruce Kreischer is fucking hilarious. That guy just enjoys life, enjoys meeting people. He's cool. You want to hang out with him. Yeah. I... I interviewed his wife twice this year because she's got a really great podcast, Leanne Kreischer. Yeah. Wife of the party. Yep. I watch. I watch it every week, and I, I, uh, my mom and I, we went to L.A. for a week back in April. We went to the comedy store, and Bert went on stage, and he was hilarious. My mother was drunk; she heckled him, and he, he was the only one who actually ignored her. But I was so fucking embarrassed. I wanted to go over to him after he was done. But then he got lured away to the main room because we were in the original room. And I was just like, God, that's a clusterfuck. I just wanted to tell him how awesome his wife is. And I, I loved interviewing her, you know, and stuff. But I didn't get to do it. And when I was there back in September, uh, didn't get to do it. That, I, didn't get to, I, didn't, I didn't get to see him at all. And I was just like, fuck. I hope I get to see him next year and tell him. And stuff. His his wife is pretty awesome. If you listen to the two podcasts we did, we basically recreated her podcast on mine. <laughs> I'll have to I'll have to listen because I love her and I love how they have the two daughters that are so different and how Leanne kind of knows about Iowa. Yeah. And then I was talking to a friend that that introduced me to Bruce Kreischer, and I told Nick, I'm like, dude, I was going to be a comic. She's like, what? I'm like, she sees stuff so differently than everybody else. It's so funny. She's fine. Because he, he introduced me to Bert, and he said, you'll like the wife. You'll understand the wife better. And I'm like, what? And he goes, because you think, you know, Kreischer's a little bit crazy. I think if you listen to his wife's podcast, you'll understand how it all works. So, like, okay, fine. so I did, and that's how I was, like, more accepting of Bert Kreischer. Originally, I was like, who the fuck is this guy talking about his wife creeping during sex? That's shall see but yeah leanne she's great and you know her friend uh her friend uh, what's her name kirsten who's who, who does a lot of episodes of her show the 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 canadian girl who's always like on the couch wiggling her toes yeah she, i listen to the podcast i do not watch it i guess i should switch that oh yeah watch it on youtube it's much better i i I, I only listen to podcasts, um, you know, if, if they don't have it on YouTube, you know, uh, for the for the visual part of it. But if it's on YouTube, you know, like this one is or or, or Bert's podcast or Joe Rogan's, I just watch it on YouTube. So Joe Rogan's another one. I did not realize he was on news radio. Mm-hmm. I didn't even know what news radio really was until two months ago. Mm-hmm. Um, that's a really good show. It was it was a funny show. Yeah, it got bad after Phil Hartman was killed, but it, it was a funny show. You know, I didn't have much appreciate appreciation for it at the time, but I do now and stuff. Yeah, I mean Rogan, he's gotten bigger. You know, I mean, you know, he he works out a lot and he's bald now, but he was like really skinny back then and he had hair and he had much yeah. more of a New Jersey accent than he does now. You know. And I saw him do stand up at the uh, Ice House in Pasadena three years ago, and he was fucking hilarious. I was watching him do his 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 then new Netflix hour, soon to be Netflix hour. I got to see like the early part of it, and it was pretty cool. And um, funny thing is, we tried to go see him the night before at the Ice House. They gave us the wrong room, so we ended up watching a, a totally different comedy show. Right. But after it was over, we saw Rogan doing a meet and greet. We should have went over to him that night because the next night he wasn't doing one. I was like, damn it. Damn it. Yeah. I mean, is it seems kind of like the, the father of comics doing podcasts? Didn't he adopt super early? 
Yeah, well, let's see, Marin, Mark Marin did it. Well, yeah. he kind of, well, okay, well, so Adam Carolla, he kind of he kind of did it first, but no one really credits him because it was still kind of radio when he did it, you know? Him, Kevin Smith, they, like, kind of did it first. You know, it was kind of radio. You know, Kevin Smith kind of figured out that it was a podcast, so he calls it Smodcast, you know, on his on his show. But then Rogan and Marin, they kind of, you know, pioneered it for comedians to do. And so there you go. I mean, that's how I found Ben Kirkman on their podcast. And I'm a huge fan of Ben Kirkman. I, I, I know her name. I'm not familiar with her stuff. She's like a little political satire. Um, mm-hmm. She's just funny. Observational comedy. It's pretty good. I would check out her older stuff. Like, she was a. Oh, blanking on the two names. She has two Netflix specials. One is like. Um, I can't. I can't remember the two. That's horrible because I watched them a few times. But <laughs> check out Jen Kirkman, the two specials on um, Netflix and the podcast. Like go back to like 2015. That's where it was really, really funny, and you kind of get to know her humor. Mm-hmm. So then now, like if you follow her, you still get it because now she's like pretty political and like super funny about the current. see Nikki Glaser. Yeah. I love her. Oh my god. I watched her her first half hour special on Netflix and she was uh she was she she said she loves she loves getting fingered like anywhere even in public. She compared it to um to like a a, a travel the travel version of Monopoly. <laughs> I thought that was brilliant. Yeah, I love it. Women need more of that and not like hold back as much because it's funny. Yeah. I love that. That was so damn funny. Oh, speaking of The Onion that you mentioned before, have you, have you seen The Onion movie? Yes. Yeah. It was good. I liked it. Josh Leon was in that. Was that. I think it was Bill Hader too, right? I think so, um, yeah. I haven't seen it since it came out. Little. Yeah, I haven't seen it since it came out, but, like, uh, me and my best friend, who, who unfortunately passed away a couple of months uh, before my accident, yeah, he and I, we watched it back in, like, 07. We were fucking cracking up. I mean, we just, we, we, we were re- 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 rewinding a lot of that movie because it was so damn funny. Uh, you know, I, I'm trying to remember, it was something like, you know, you hear, like, a tender voice narration, and you see, like, um, the early morning, beautiful skies, and then every three seconds they cut to like fifteen guys sixty nine each other. <laughs> and then there was that. There was a. I am. I am totally wrong. I've not seen it. You haven't seen it. I'm looking it up right now, and it's actually um, a futile and stupid gesture. Oh yes, I saw. I saw that. National Lampoon. So I'm way off. I saw that. Yeah. I liked it a lot too. And there, and there was a scene that was cut out. You'll you'll like this since you're since you're into baseball. Uh, there's a scene that was cut out where this retarded guy is going to the electric chair, and his last words are "I like baseball." And then they electrocute him, and the cops and the priest are laughing their asses off. <laughs> yeah, see that, and that's funny. Like I 
funny. You just have to have a sense of humor, and then it's funny. Yeah. I love that. I love that kind of irreverent humor. You know, that's the kind of humor that I want to do when I get out to L.A. And I was supposed to move out there back in July. It fell through. This girl that I met on Facebook early last year, um, she, I was supposed to move in with her. She had a she had a rape baby son, you know, and fucking she got in trouble with the law. And I found out about it middle of May, and I was like, God damn it, this was going to be my year to go out there and do something, you know, but I'm glad it didn't happen. Now I get a little bit more time to stay here and lose weight and get ready for next year. LA is best. Don't hesitate to go. Other, other than the, the shitty traffic, everything is great there. Yeah, I mean, I have a friend that lives in Hollywood that actually doesn't even have a car. Um, she was the first. And yeah. she was close to the comedy club on Sunset on purpose. So, and there's that. You, know, you can use your toothpick. Yeah. I love, I, I love going to the comedy clubs out there and stuff. But I'm definitely going to do all that stuff. I just can't wait. You know, it's, it's my time, I feel. You know, I, I mean, I wish I had gone, you know, 10 years ago or so, but I'm glad that I got this time now and stuff uh, as I'm approaching middle age, you know. Dreams, middle age. Middle age. <laughs> dreams don't have an expiration date. <laughs> That's true. That's very true. Absolutely. So, Catherine, there's this game that I like to play with guests on the show, and how this game works is, right, it's, I ask silly slumber party questions you answer them and then i you ask me the exact same one i asked you and then i answer it okay Catherine, are you ticklish yes tell me are you ticklish i am baby ticklish yes what's your favorite part of the body it can be any your favorite part? Never heard that response before. I have always loved the belly button. Um, what color are your toenails painted? Currently they are blue. What color are your toenails painted? They're not painted right now because it's winter time. <laughs> and is there a stinky smell that just makes you gag? Um, like gross dog poo. Oh yeah, that's the worst. Yeah. And for me, I don't like farts and I don't like feet. Okay. Actually, I do like feet, but not the smell of of it when it's really bad. (laughs) That's fair. Yes. Well, Catherine, I thank you so much for coming on today. This was a lot of fun, and I'm so glad that you're in comedy now. Thanks. I am, too. Thanks for having me. This was fun. Really good day. Absolutely. Let's do this again next year. You got it. We'll be in L.A. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Or even before I go to L.A., you know, if you got something uh, going on that you want to promote or something. Okay. I'll let you know for sure. Okay. You have yourself a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. You too. Thank you. Thanks, Tommy. My Bye. pleasure. Bye-bye. Well, there you have it. Catherine Brinkman. Ain't she a sweetheart? I just love Catherine. She's a lot of fun. And I'm so glad she's in comedy. I had no fucking idea. That is so awesome. Um, if you like this video, everyone, please subscribe to my YouTube channel. Add me as a friend on Facebook. Join my Tommy Kovac comedian page on Facebook. Follow me on Twitter and Instagram and all that fun stuff. Well, that's all the time we have this week on Splat from the Past. Until next time, this is Tommy Throwback Kovac saying, there's no shame in living in the past because the present sucks. 
Later, dudes.